Harvest New Beginnings Church is located in Oswego, Illinois. We exist for God's glory alone, encouraging each other to have a deep love for God and a sincere love for people. This message is brought to you by Pastor Scott Poling. It is all about Jesus. It is Jesus who created everything, Colossians 1. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. It is all about Jesus. It is Jesus alone who saves, Acts 4. There's no salvation, salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. It is all about Jesus. It is Jesus who's returning with power and glory in Luke 21. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. It's all about Jesus. It's Jesus who will judge every single person who's ever lived. John 5. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. It's all about Jesus. It is Jesus to whom every person will bow and confess, Philippians 2, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It is all about Jesus. It is Jesus who will rule and reign with power. In Revelation 11, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. It is all about Jesus. It is Jesus who never changes. Hebrews 13, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. It is all about Jesus. It is Jesus who is God. John 1, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It is all about Jesus. It always has been in the past. It is all about Jesus right now in the present. It is all about Jesus forever and eternity in front of us. It is all about Jesus. And if your life is not pointed toward Jesus, your life is pointed in the wrong direction. If your life doesn't revolve around Jesus, you're lost in this life. And you're without direction. Because it's not about you. It's all about who? It's all about Jesus. And that's why we're studying Jesus. That's why we're looking in the Gospel of John and we've titled this series, Glory Among Us, because it's all about him. And we see a man in John chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, turn there. We see this man in John chapter 1 who knows it's all about Jesus. He's pointing everyone to Jesus. He's talking to everyone about Jesus. And his name is John. And he's a Baptist. And we read about him in John chapter 1, starting in verse 35, as we continue our series in the Gospel of John. John chapter 1 and verse 35. Again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. He looked at Jesus as he walked and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. It's all about Jesus. That's why first we need to look at Jesus. Say that with me. Look at Jesus. Now, John the Baptist is with his disciples, and he's standing out in the wilderness, presumably here, 15 miles from Jerusalem, thereabouts, and he's been baptizing people and preaching repentance, and he's by the Jordan River, and he's with two of his disciples. See, it's not just Jesus that had disciples. Other teachers had disciples. And John the Baptist has these followers, these disciples. They are learners who attach themselves to a teacher. One of John's disciples, you will soon find out if you drop down to verse 40, is Andrew. 
So we know one of these disciples is Andrew. The other is unnamed. Most believe that it is the Apostle John, the writer of this book, the Gospel of John. You may say, why do they consider it to be John? Because John never mentions himself in the book anywhere, as is the case here. And John is mentioned in Mark chapter 1, where you see two pairs of brothers. He was going along by the Sea of Galilee. He saw Simon and Andrew. And later, a little further, we see James and John. And so more than likely, most people believe this is John as well as Andrew. Now, John the Baptist sees Jesus, and Jesus is walking. This is God, who is walking on the planet he has created. This is the second person of the Trinity, who has become a man, Emmanuel, and now dwells among us. This is the Shekinah glory of God descending out of heaven and into the temple of a human body. That's who he is. And John, with this clear clarion voice, loud, says, Behold the Lamb of God. And he proclaims it with an exclamation point with added emphasis and a boldness and this unashamed declaration, behold the Lamb of God. The same words in verse 29 that he has used earlier. Spoken to the entire crowd then, spoken to these two disciples now. Behold the Lamb of God. Now, remember the meaning of the Lamb. There's this rich history in Israel. Dating back to Abraham in Genesis, the interchange between Abraham and his son, when Abraham says in Genesis 22, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. The lamb, from the very beginning, is the substitute. Dating back to the Passover in Exodus, when the lamb was slain. In verse 7 of Exodus 12, moreover, they take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. It is the Lord's Passover. In verse 13, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And so it was the blood of the lamb put on the doorposts and on the lintel. And it was faith in the blood of the lamb that saved them from judgment and death. And it's the same for you and me. It is faith in the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ who saves us from death and judgment. There's this rich history when it comes to the Lamb. And there's the ancient prophecy we saw. In Isaiah 53, he was oppressed and afflicted. He didn't open his mouth. And like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. The prophecy of the Lamb of God. Also seen in Jeremiah 11. I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. So we have this rich history and we have this ancient prophecy. And we have the day in and day out, every day practice twice a day in the land of Israel that the the lamb was slain. Exodus 29. Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two one-year-old lambs each day continuously. The one lamb you shall offer in the morning and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight every single day. A lamb is sacrificed in the morning and a lamb is sacrificed at night. And the next day, a lamb is sacrificed in the morning and a lamb is sacrificed at night. And the next day, and the next day, and the next day. Throughout the history of Israel with the tabernacle, throughout the history of Israel with the temple, every single day, twice a day, a lamb is sacrificed and a lamb is substituted. It's all about the lamb. It's all about Jesus, the lamb of God. And so we look at Jesus. And next, we follow Jesus. Say that with me. Follow Jesus. Verse 37, John's two disciples heard John the Baptist speak, and they follow Jesus. The words of John stir these two to action. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He is the one prophecies have foretold. He is the one we have been awaiting for. It's all about 
Jesus. They hear about him, they follow him. But I don't think they fully comprehend him and what will happen to the Lamb. In spite of the history and in spite of the prophecy, I think they don't realize the depth of what is taking place when they follow Jesus. Lambs are for slaughtering on the altar. Jesus' life will end in sacrifice and slaughter. To follow the lamb means pain and hardship and possible death. Nothing is mentioned about your best life now. To follow the lamb means pain and hardship and possible death. Understand, following the lamb is hard, Christian. Stop listening to these health, wealth, gospel preachers out there. Following the lamb is hard. It is Jesus in Matthew 16 who said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, do you wish to follow Jesus? Answer. Then you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will what? Lose your life. Lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. 2 Timothy 3.12 All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be what? Persecuted. How many? All. No exception. If you want to live a godly life and you want to follow the Lamb, life is going to be hard at times. And you will be persecuted. You will be mocked as a follower of Jesus Christ. You will be made fun of. You will be cursed at. And in some countries, you will be killed. You may say, well, what happened to these two who followed the Lamb? According to tradition, Andrew would be crucified on an X-shaped cross in the land of Greece. John was banished to the island of Patmos. It says here they followed Jesus. Now, followed has a double meaning. They literally walked after Jesus and with Jesus that day. But they also would follow Jesus the rest of their days. There would be an allegiance and a commitment to Jesus for the rest of their lives. What else did this mean? It meant following Jesus meant they stopped following John. To follow Jesus meant they no longer followed John. John would lose two of his disciples at this point, two of his followers. They would leave John behind. They would leave John for Jesus. Ouch. But that's okay. Because we don't follow people. We don't follow men. We follow Jesus. We can learn from men and we can appreciate their leading and their gifting and their encouragement, but we don't follow men. There was a church in the New Testament that we read of in Corinth that got this all backwards. The Corinthians church was full of jealousy and full of strife and they were picking sides. And we read in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, you're still fleshly. For since there's jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? He says, when one says, well, I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos, are you not like mere men? What is Apollos and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each. I planted, uh, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. It's all about God. It's all about Jesus. We don't follow men. We follow Jesus. You, you don't follow a pastor. You don't follow a religious leader. You don't even follow John the Baptist, who Jesus said was the greatest man born of women. You don't even follow this guy. You don't follow men. All men are broken and sinful and fallen. You look to Jesus and you follow Jesus because it's all about, it's all about Jesus. I think this is another reason why, though, John is called the greatest man born among women by Jesus. John loses two of his disciples right here, two of his followers. There's no jealousy. There's no sadness. There's no anger. 
Please understand this. John has been the main attraction. We're told everyone in Jerusalem is going out to see John. Everyone in the entire area of Judea is going out to see and hear John. He's been the show, man. Not anymore. They're now leaving John. And they're following Jesus. William Barclay put it this way. He, that is John the Baptist, came to attach men not to himself but to Christ. There is no harder task than to take the second place when once the first place was enjoyed. And that's exactly what John the Baptist does. And John is not possessive of people, and John is not possessive of followers. I want you to notice there's no attempt to stop his disciples from following Jesus. There's no attempt to hold on to them. There's no talking to them saying, hey, you know, follow Jesus for a little bit, but make sure you come back to me. You know, I need your help, or I led you to the Lord, or don't forget I baptized you, or I'm counting on you. The only thing that matters is that people are following Jesus. Not hanging on to people, not accumulating our own followers, not building our own ministry kingdom. John would later say it in John 3, he must, that is Jesus, he must increase, I must what? Decrease. This is important. This is important for us as a church to learn, as a congregation to learn. This is important for us on staff as pastors and leaders to learn. We are not in competition with other people. We're not in competition with other Jesus-preaching churches. We're not in competition with those who are leading people to Christ and they want them to be Christ followers. We are on the same page with other churches. We're on the same team with other churches who are leading people to Jesus and pointing people to Jesus. As a matter of fact, we're part of the same family. We're part of the same family. Our job is to point people to Jesus. Our goal is for people to follow Jesus. Listen, our goal is not attendance for attendance sake. Our goal is not numbers for numbers sake. Our goal is not members for members sake. Do we praise God for the people he's brought to our church? Yes, amen. But that's not our goal. Our goal is to point people to Jesus. Our our job is to point people to Jesus. Our goal is for people to follow Jesus. Listen, that means church isn't about you. And church isn't about me. That means church isn't about us. That means church isn't about how you like something or how you don't like something. Because the focus is not you. And the focus is not me. It's all about who? It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. So we point people to Jesus, and we talk to people about Jesus, and we help people become Jesus followers. It's all about Jesus. By the way, it's all about worshiping Jesus. We sang five songs today. The lion and the lamb found in you. This is amazing grace. The Amazing Grace, King of My Heart. I I didn't know what songs we would be singing today. So yesterday I texted Nancy, my assistant, and I said, hey, would you just find out what songs we're singing and, and, and would you see the stanzas we're singing and would you let me know how many references there are to Jesus in the songs that we sing? How many references either by the name Jesus, a pronoun used for him, or a title used for him, such as lamb or king or something like that? We sung five songs. There were 104 references to Jesus. Just about 21 references per song. Every song was about who? Every song about Jesus. Only one song we sang this morning never mentioned the name of Jesus in any way, whether by pronoun, title, or by the name Jesus. And that was the old hymn, Amazing Grace. It's the only one that never mentioned the name Jesus. So that should be burned, that hymn. No. (laughs) It's a great hymn. It points to the grace of God. It just doesn't mention the name Jesus. Understand that. It's still a God-glorifying song. But it's all about Jesus. 
So we look at Jesus, and we follow Jesus, and next we seek Jesus. Say that with me. Seek Jesus. Look at verse 38. I love this. So these guys are kind of in the back following Jesus, and Jesus takes off running. No, he doesn't. He turns, he saw them following, and he said to them, what do you seek? Say that with me. What do you seek? These are the very first words of Jesus in the book of John. These are the very first words he speaks. How do I know that? They're in red. (laughs) These are the very first words of Jesus in this book. And they come in the form of a question. He questions these two men that are following him. But he's also questioning you. And he's also questioning me. What do you seek? I love how gracious Jesus is. These guys are following. He turns around and he initiates the conversation. He opens the door for this relationship. Again, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't hide. He doesn't hide from us when we begin following him. He doesn't speed up to try to get away from us because he sees all the baggage in this life we're carrying. He, he doesn't just leave us to search aimlessly in this life till the time we die. No, he turns and he initiates relationship. Now, he says, what do you seek? Jesus wasn't in need of any information. This, this question was not for Jesus' sake, okay? He's omniscient. He knows who they are. He knows why they're there. The question wasn't for him. The question was for them. And the question is for you. Notice Jesus doesn't ask, who do you seek? He says, what do you seek? And I want you to get this. This is a soul-searching question. What do you seek? This is a motive-revealing question. What do you seek? This is a thought-provoking question. What do you think? He's saying, I want you to reflect deeper and ponder this sincerely and think longer on what it is you really want. What do you seek? What do you seek, you follower of Jesus? Is it things, possessions, a job, a title? What what do you seek from God? Is it release from pain or peace in some relationship? What do you seek from God? Is it help with your finances? Is it answers in life? Is it some answer to prayer? Honestly, what do you seek? Why are you following him? Do you seek me? Or do you seek me for what you want from me? Why do you follow Jesus? What do you seek? Is it for what we can get out of God? What do you seek when you come to church? Why are you in church today? Out of habit? Because you had to serve? What do you seek? Because your mom made you? Your spouse talked you into it? Or she made you watch the online service this morning. Hello. (laughs) What do you seek? Maybe you're here out of guilt. What do you seek? The question is, do you really seek Jesus or are you seeking what you can get out of him? 
What do you seek? Are you seeking a church where you feel comfortable and everything is just right? Is that why you're here? Are you seeking a certain style of worship? Or a certain style of preacher or personality of preacher? Are you seeking that that children's program? That youth program? What do you seek? Are you really seeking Jesus? That's the question. Go deeper and search your soul. Seek Jesus. To know him and to follow him. To spend time with him. And to love him. To understand him, the one who died on the cross for you. And to go deeper in your relationship with this God who became a man so that you could go to heaven. Come here seeking Jesus. Now, I want to stop and I want to do something different now. I want us to pause. And I want you to take a moment and I want you to pray. And I want you to spend some time, just a few minutes with God. And I want you to talk to him about what you're really seeking. Just just close your eyes and bow your heads right now. He's asking, what do you seek? Would you talk to him? Let God refine us. Maybe there are sins that need to be confessed right now. And attitudes. Because it's been about us and not Jesus. What do you seek? Would you draw close to him right now and just tell him that you love him and that you want to learn? Spend more time. Consecrate yourself right now to God. Reposition the trajectory of your life to him. Because it's all about him. Lord, we ask that you would help us as your children to truly seek you. We get caught up in so many distractions in this world and we ask for forgiveness. Help us go deep in our relationship to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to know what that means and what it looks like. Lord, help us as a church to be all things Jesus and not all things us. And we ask now, Lord, that you would just continue to speak through your word And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We look at Jesus, we follow Jesus, we seek Jesus. It's all about Jesus, and we stay with Jesus. Say that with me, stay with Jesus. Look at verse 38, the second part of it, and verse 39. They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. Notice they never really answered Jesus' question. What do you seek? Hey, Rabbi, where are you staying? That's not the answer. They call him Rabbi, which is a title of respect and honor. And for us Gentile readers, John translates it for us. It means teacher. 
And then we see three times one word is used in these verses. Staying, verse 38. Staying, verse 39. Stayed, verse 39. And staying can also have a double meaning. It is used elsewhere as abide with me. Remain with me. They will stay with him that day and they will remain with him and abide with him for the rest of of their lives. Why do they ask this question though? Where are you staying? I believe it's because they want to visit, a longer visit. And if you're unable to spend time with us right now, Lord, would you make time for us later? Can, can we sit and can we interact with you? And can we listen and can we learn from you? Where are you staying? I love this about these guys. They're not interested in a passing conversation with Jesus. They want more. They're interested in spending time and getting to know him. It's not about making his acquaintance, but going deeper in their relationship with him. There are too many people and too many Christians who only have these passing conversations with God. When they're in a fix, or they need something from God, and God, you need to help me out, because I got myself in trouble right here. And so we have these passing conversations with God instead of saying, God, I want to sit with you, and I want to open your word, and I want to I know what it means to be your child. And I want to I pray, Lord. I really want to seek you in prayer. Not just make his acquaintance and say, it was nice to see you today, God. But to say, I want to know you and who you are. You've created me. You sustained me. You, you bled and died for me. You've saved me. You're going to resurrect my body. I'm going to be with you for all eternity. Who are you, God? Get to know your God. And stop with the passing conversations. Seek him. And stay with him. He wants to be your friend. He loves you. Their question is met with Jesus' invitation. Where are you staying? And he says, come. And you will see. What an invitation is that? Come spend the day with God. Just come and spend the day with Jesus. What an invitation. Growing up, I played a lot of tennis. I, I was a good tennis player, not professional level. Uh, for two years, I, uh, I lived at the Nick Boletary Tennis Academy in Bradenton, Florida. Uh, it's an international boarding school, is what it is for athletes. Uh, it's now the IMG Academy. Top juniors in many sports around the world come there. Tennis, basketball, golf, baseball, lacrosse, soccer, track and field. Uh, one of my roommates and my best friends was Andre Agassi. Um, you young kids have no clue who that is, but he was the Roger Federer of the day, the Rafael Nadal, number one tennis player in the world. Uh, we were roommates, best friends. We went to church together. We went to Bible studies together. We were baptized together. We spent a lot of time together. Uh, nothing like getting a call from Andre. Hey, I'm playing the U.S. Open end of August, September. Would you, would you like coming up, spending a couple days? Uh, no, I'm busy, sorry. <laughs> and uh, spending, spending a couple days in a penthouse suite overlooking uh, Central Park and go to all the practices and the matches and go out to dinners and breakfasts and there's the lunch. It's pretty nice. Uh, I'll never forget being invited to his home in Vegas for a couple days. He said, Scott, I want to fly you out, spend a couple days out here. And uh, I fly out there. He's at the gate. You could go at the gate at that time. To, he's at the gate picking me up at the airport little old me. And uh, we hung out, we drove around in the desert having a great time with one of his three or four cars. Um, next day we played some tennis and then drove up into the mountains with the snow up there and just had a great time. You know, there's just nothing like being invited to spend the day with Andre. Just nothing like it. By the way, pray for him. I don't have contact with him anymore. I don't know where he is spiritually. 
I'm in touch with some of his siblings, but not with him. So when you think about him, pray for him. There's nothing quite like being invited by Andre. Actually, there's something so much better and so much greater. And that's spending the day with Jesus. Staying with Jesus. Where are you staying? Come and you will see. And so they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. Now, the 10th hour Roman time would be 10 a.m. The 10th hour Jewish time would be 4 p.m. Most commentators lean toward the 10 a.m. because he's already translated things for the Gentile audience. So 10 a.m. And it's amazing to me because John can probably tell you the, he could tell you the exact hour right here. He could probably tell you the exact spot he was standing on and what he was wearing and what the weather was like because it was a moment that changed his life forever. The moment that the Lord invited him to come. I mean, this personal relationship with the God of the universe began here. And he stayed with Jesus. They walked with him, spent time with him, talked with him, listened. They learned from him. All day with Jesus. That'd be a good title for a book. All day with Jesus. You know, something I loved about Andre is he was never too important for me. And he was never too busy for me. You know what I love about the Lord? He's never too important for us. And he's never too busy for us. He always has time for you. He will always listen to you. Your Lord is there for you. Spend time with him. Because Jesus' invitation, I believe, is still open. Come and you will see. So stay with him. The invitation is open. Spend time with the Lamb of God. Spend time with Emmanuel, God with us. Spend time with the anointed Messiah. Spend time. Sit with God and listen to God and learn from God and pray to him. Spend time. Come. The invitation is still there. To the weary in this world and to the weary that are of this world. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you what? I'll give you rest. To the rich young man who is so full of himself. In Matthew 19, 21. Come and follow me. To the youngest among us. Mark chapter 10. Permit the children to come to me. To those who thirst for the true meaning of life. John 7. Let him come to me and drink. Would you come to Jesus? Because it's all about him. It's all about Jesus. So, look at Jesus. Follow Jesus. Seek Jesus. Stay with Jesus. And come to Jesus. If you've been prompted by this message and are in need of a new beginning or would like more information about Harvest New Beginnings, visit at harvest.church.